to the introduction. As uh, Daniel has said, I'm Ryan Zrama from Commerce Guys, and our mission is to engineer simpler solutions to the hardest parts of selling online. And I'd say we haven't always had um, this mission. It really is a, a, a product of us um, spinning out from Platform.sh and refocusing as a core team uh, around Drupal Commerce specifically, whereas before the business was a combination of things. Um, our team is, is once again focused just on Drupal Commerce and, and consulting and support and services related to it. Um, with me and the core team, although not with us in this presentation, are Boyan Jovanovic, um, who said he wishes he could be with us, but he had a very important meeting with a lady. <laughs> and so I said, by all means, take your meeting. <laughs> and um, Matt Glaman, who is enjoying Thanksgiving dinner with his family. And um, my kids are watching television while I present this here tonight. Um, if you saw us at DrupalCon Dublin, um, you know, this, will, this will be familiar content, although I, I won't make it just about the presentation. Um, but uh, at, at DrupalCon Dublin, we did sort of decide to start again with, with why Drupal Commerce? Um, what, why is it worth keeping Drupal Commerce around on Drupal 8? Why not just make Drupal um, a front end for third party e commerce applications? Why not just make it a bridge to Shopify? or a front end for Magento or what, whatever other system you, you know, it is that you want to pair it up with. And you know, it really kind of goes back to our roots as being a free software project. Um, we, we truly believe in free open source software. Um, we don't believe in dual licenses. We don't believe that the code that we're writing is so special that it deserves to be um, you know, charged hundreds of thousands of dollars over and over again to every person who ever ends up using the tools that we're creating. And in fact, the, the value that we do try to bring to our clients and our projects is our experience, not just the code that we write. And if anybody's ever looked through Drupal 7's add to cart form uh, code, they know that the value is not significant in some of our code. Um, but of course, you're trying to improve that. And that is, again, the benefit of being a free software project is that we get contributions from folks all over the world, including folks that are on this um, call right now. What's up, Andy G? Feel free to hit me with a hard question. Um, we also believe um, that uh, you know. Ah, jeez. One sec. This is this is again where where GoTo webinar is getting in the way. <laughs> um, we do believe that that Drupal does provide us with with a really solid foundation for building um, very complex business applications and. This was, was really made very clear to us whenever we were having a conversation with the CTO of Oro, which is um, at first Oro CRM, now is also Oro Commerce, a B2B e-commerce platform, all based on Symfony. And um, Oro was really kind of a, a, a collection of expats from Magento um, who decided to once again attempt a commerce play. Um, but once again, they had to rebuild their Drupal, basically, and that's what the Aura platform is. It is their, their business application platform that gives you views and rules and theming layers and user access control and so on and so forth. And we get that all for free by natively extending Drupal. And then we also believe that merchants and developers benefit when we wed content and commerce together. And what we're looking for, even in the projects that we do deliver, where we're making Drupal a front end for a third party commerce platform, is how can we get as much information and structured information about the commerce um, side of things into the content side of things? Um, because we, we do find ways to make you know, personalization and product recommendations and smart analytics work um, that you can't really make work effectively when everything is in its own silo. Um, and, and lastly, you know, again, we do believe that there is a strong play for Drupal Commerce to work in partnership with third-party applications. For example, um, one of our, our main clients this last year that sponsored a lot of Drupal Commerce development um, had us create a subscription billing platform for them that acts as a front end for Zuora, which is itself a subscription billing platform. Um, but they were able to get the shopping experience that they wanted and the checkout experience that they wanted and then depend on the third-party platform, Zura, for um, all of the sort of back office management and um, asset licensing and so on. Um, so whenever you, you sort of open up Drupal Commerce and, and start to extend the Drupal site to do commerce, um, you know, you can create uh, uh, new, new revenue channels on existing content sites and by using Drupal models you don't have to learn a third-party API to integrate into your Drupal site. Um, you can expand internationally with all that that entails, including multi 
multilingual, multi-currency, multi-site deployments, et cetera, et cetera, um, without having to uh, work around the limitations of a third-party product information management system um, or you know, tax um, automation platform or whatever. And um, you can also um, create one website that handles the unique needs of your various types of customers. And that's exactly what um, our showcase site that we presented at DrupalCon Dublin does. It's the Sport Obermeyer rebuild um, that we delivered in partnership with Blue Spark, um, based out of, well, they're distributed, their headquarters is in Raleigh, North Carolina. We're in Greenville, South Carolina, so representing Panther Nation. Um, we love you, Luke Keekley. Uh, get well soon. And, um, you know, the uh, this website was a replacement of um, multiple um, platforms that Obermeyer had adopted over time, including a D6 Ubercard site, a standalone Cilia site, a software as a service platform, all handling different parts of their product catalog, whether it was B2B or B2C or B2C with a loyalty program and so on. Um, and so definitely check out the, uh, the case study for this on Blue Sparks website if you want to learn more about the project. And um, I think, uh, you know, Dries, uh, shoot, no, that was a different case study he used in his recent blog post. Um, but, but ultimately, one of the coolest things that you can do is to come here and check out the Outfit Builder um, because it's, it's a good example of, of a tailor-made shopping experience that you won't be able to do or easily recreate in other commerce platforms where we could say, take a curated list of products, um, in this case, um, different parts of an ensemble, if you will, um, and uh, you know, put together the perfect outfit um, that um, you know you want for your next skiing adventure. So here we go. We're going to check out our men's outfit builder, and perhaps I want a classic look, um, and we're going to go for the classic look with a proton jacket. And here, what happens is I can uh, create um, my full outfit and add these suckers to the cart. I don't know why I'd have an extra large jacket, but ultimately. Um, you know, from an editorial standpoint, they were able to string together these different product pages um, so that as a customer I can come and uh, create an entire look from that one page and then check it out and purchase it either from them directly or through their shopping partner or B2B partners and so on. And it's like all of the all of the complexity behind the scenes here is all Drupal 8 commerce um, and what I'm about to show is kind of like the underpinnings of this. Um, so just to, to take a step back into the slides, um, we started again with Drupal Commerce on Drupal 8 um, from scratch in 2014, um, really uh, because we knew that Drupal 8 was such a significant difference from Drupal 7 uh, that, that it wasn't really worth just doing a straightforward port of our module set. And I mean, there's something to be said for not losing a lot of time recreating a complex set of modules on every new version of Drupal that comes out, um, because it does take a while. Obviously, we started in 2014, it's now 2016, and we just hit beta at DrupalCon Dublin. Um, and yet, you, you lose a lot by not rethinking how you've implemented your entity types and your configuration forms and your design patterns and your modules and so on um, when, when the underlying framework has changed so significantly. Um, so we, we built from scratch. Um, since we have a beta now, we do maintain an update path between beta releases. And the latest tag beta was uh, beta 3, um, which I think was just, uh, oh, I can't remember if it was the start of this month or last month. Um, but, you know, the, the betas are including payment and pricing and promotions, payment for off-site and on-site, um, payment gateways. And um, I know that uh, latest work has been around um, continuing to improve the checkout user experience and also um, uh, checkout completion emails and, and logic. Um, and I know that most recently, Boyan has been very actively engaged in the sort of physical product space with our physical fields module, the commerce physical integration, and the commerce shipping module, um, which is going to support multiple shipments and uh, kind of a, a re-implemented you know, shipping paradigm um, out of the box. And um, Andy G, who's also on this call, as I called out earlier, has been a big part of helping us um, nail down that architecture. And uh, Boyan just finally decided to go for it. And so you can find that work in the commerce shipping um, repository on Drupal.org. Um, whenever we stepped um, back to, to think through what exactly we wanted to do differently on Drupal 8, um, we, we realized that we really needed to prioritize user experience from the get-go. 
um, because we kind of we, we built the framework to be very modular and very lightweight on Drupal 7 kind of expecting um, contributors to develop more user-friendly backend interfaces and product administration interfaces and so on um, but those didn't really materialize and for whatever reason the projects that we sold at the time didn't lend themselves to creating these uh, you know modules that we wanted to simplify the user experience um, for, for Drupal 7 users and um, one of the best examples was the inline entity form that lets you create products inline on your product pages um, whereas in Drupal 7 you had to create your SKUs individually and then sort of tie them together on a product page now you we have inline entity form as a dependency and we've prioritized making smart product pages out of the box and we're also providing more direction and mentorship to developers and agencies that have been interested in contributing so not only did we sort of collaborate with partners to develop the architecture for shipping we've done the same thing for other modules like stock and recurring billing wish lists um, what was the most recent one? Drat. The uh, the particular module was not coming to me, but um, Boyan just spent you know a, a day of um, collaboration with Steve Oliver and um, Olaf. Um, I can't remember his last name, but um, you know architecting a module that those guys are now developing, and Boyan is essentially mentoring them through the development proce uh, process for Drupal 8. And we've done that time and time again with different Drupal agencies and different developers who've been interested in getting involved. And really that's all about creating a stronger um, ecosystem of developers and contributors to the project um, so that the project can be more successful long term. Um, finally, we're incorporating more critical functionality into the core of commerce itself. And um, as I'll demonstrate, you know, promotions and coupons are the, the main thing there. The, the big contributed module um, package that's making it into the core of Drupal Commerce. Um, we are dependent on Drupal 8.2.0 or higher, um, uh, and um, golly, I don't know why it says RC1 there. I think that might mean beta 1, <laughs> or, or rather that might be uh, related to the, the RC1 for Drupal 8.2 itself. Um, and what's nice is that with each successive minor release of Drupal, because um, Drupal Core now uses semantic versioning, and lets you put new features and new modules into those dot one and dot two dot oh releases. Um, more and more of our code ends up being a core part of Drupal itself. We're also contributing back to Drupal's core um, composer and entity API support. And as a result, we actually do require composer now, which throws a lot of people off. Um, but if we, if we just sort of think about how complicated um, an e-commerce application is, um, it makes sense that we would begin to push people toward using a dependency management tool instead of just letting them grab modules and libraries willy-nilly and try to keep everything in sync. Um, so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, to um, exit out of Keynote here, pull up the terminal, and hopefully that's um, still legible um, despite the, uh, the background. In fact, let me, um, let me kill the opacity on this sucker. Of course, I'm probably not going to be able to find it in short order. Um, it looks clear to me. I don't know if anyone. Okay, yeah. cool. Let us know Sorry. if you can't see the uh, the text box, <laughs> please. Um, and so what? what uh, you know what? What you're looking at here is how I've installed Drupal Commerce to demo it locally. So I have an, a new installation of Drupal Commerce, kind of ready to go. That's using what's called a project base, and as you can see this here in my um, command line. Um, I have, well, I had to kind of up the memory limit to infinity for my particular installation of Composer. Um, but I'm creating a project, which is a Composer command, that can point to our project base um, to install Drupal with all of Drupal Commerce modules and dependencies um, kind of prefetched and added to my code base, which is amazing. I don't have to individually grab the five libraries that we're dependent on and the module packages and Drupal 8 and all of the libraries that our contributed modules are dependent on, um, this one command is getting everything for me. And we do have similar commands for adding Drupal Commerce to existing Drupal sites. Um, but just look at everything that gets installed when I ran this command. Um, it basically um, you know, gets all of Drupal Core's dependencies, um, which sure you, you don't have to get a dev version of Drupal core if you don't want to um, but for our purposes as developers and as module maintainers it's nice to be able to get 
um, <clears throat> the most up-to-date versions of all of these libraries. Um, and uh, we finally get to the point where it has installed Drupal core and then some modules that Drupal Commerce is dependent on, the state machine module, um, which is going to give us um, multiple order and checkout and payment workflows uh, in a much more controlled fashion than the sort of random um, status updates that we had in Commerce 1. We have the Entity API, which gives us additional um, functionality over what Drupal Core has for working with entities in Drupal 8. The Profile module, which we now contribute to and depend on for customer profiles instead of our own <coughs> entity type. And on down the line, of course I mentioned already the inline entity form, which lets us embed a product add or edit form on a product pages directly. Um, then we have a handful of libraries that Commerce Guys has developed and released as standalone libraries um, to the broader PHP community, um, including um, libraries that support the address module. So the addressing library here supports that. It's all installed and configured for me without me having to fetch these things and make sure my versions are in sync. And then finally, we do get to commerce itself and then the commerce base um, profile. So uh, ultimately, all this stuff is, is fetched for me with one composer command line. Um, now, at the end of the day, I don't have to maintain the Git uh, or other um, histories. You know, I have the option to remove them if I wanted to. Um, but ultimately, you know, we now see I have my store um, and I can go into that directory and see that I have uh, a web directory um, that has my actual, um, I guess, uh, doc root, um, my composer.json file, which if we wanted to take a look at that, would show all of the different um, libraries and dependencies that have been added to this code base. Um, and inside of web, we can even see a, a standard Drupal 8 um, uh, root directory. If I pop over into the modules directory and contrib, uh, we'll see that we do have the commerce module, the address module, and other dependencies um, kind of already in place for us so that um, we can go ahead and install Drupal 8.2.3. Or Drupal 8 <coughs> and as it goes, this is just my store. Um, it's not only going to install um, a standard Drupal 8 profile, uh, but it's actually installing Commerce Base, which includes um, Drupal Commerce and all of its dependencies kind of ready for us to dig into. Um, so that's, that's what it looks like to install Drupal Commerce from scratch. You can read more about that at docs.drupalcommerce.org. Um, there's a whole section there on how to install using Composer why we're using Composer, why we think it's important for the Drupal community overall to be using Composer. Um, and um, there are also documentations, there are documents there, or pages there documenting how to install Drupal Commerce on existing um, Drupal 8 sites. Daniel, I didn't just create a whole bunch of questions that I already get to. Uh, no, there's, there's no questions yet. Just because he's talking at the speed of light doesn't mean you can't ask questions. Feel free to. <laughs> All right. Um, so as I mentioned, you know, Composer is there to help us manage all of our dependencies. And, um, you know, for, for us, Drupal 8 is a chance for us to get off the island, not just in the sense that we are finding and taking advantage of other people's libraries to improve the, um, you know, to improve the, the commerce modules, but we're also exporting our libraries. Um, as I mentioned, we have tax and addressing internationalization libraries that we're now sharing with the broader PHP community. And you can see that some of them have had quite some reception, including our addressing library, which handles locale specific address form creation, validation, and address formatting for every country in the world. Um, that was powered um, by the Android SDK's data set, um, which we're now contributing back to as Drupal community members are submitting patches to improve the currency for, or the, the um, address formats for their countries. So it's really cool to see the way that taking advantage of these sort of standard PHP site building tools and now tapping us into the broader PHP community and funneling um, our code and Drupal, the Drupal community's intelligence into these projects that have wide reaching influence like the Android SDK um, or our INTL library which is powering our, our number and currency formatting, locale specific for every country in the world. Um, that's now feeding into Symphony itself. Um, so it's just kind of kind of fun to see um, 
you know, that, that for years we've been amassing this knowledge as a Drupal community that's focused on e-commerce or a subset of the Drupal community. And now that knowledge and experience we've gained is, is going off the island because we've decided as a community to adopt and embrace the broader PHP world. Um, kind of already demonstrated how to use that composer. Um, create project command. Um, obviously, if you want to find out more, um, the link there in the footer is key. Um, uh, we have a full set of installation docs that you can walk through. And if you get stuck anywhere, you know, find us in IRC or head to drupal.stackexchange.com, um, which for us is the official support forum for um, Drupal Commerce. So using the, the Drupal-commerce tag on Drupal Answers is, is the best way to reach us and the dozens and hundreds of Drupal Commerce developers um, out there that would be happy to help you with your problems. Um, so I already mentioned that we have the inline entity form uh, module as a dependency. Um, but, and, and I also mentioned the profile module and state machine module. Um, the address module maybe deserves some special mention because it is our replacement for um, our address field module, which was our Drupal 7 dependency. Um, this module um, provides uh, an address field um, along with form elements and other interfaces for working with um, and formatting addresses from all over the world. Um, the underlying data model is the same. Um, it's still using the extensible name and address language um, the schema that we found and adopted for Drupal Commerce on Drupal 7. Um, but it's just a, ideally a smarter implementation with um, address format rules coming from a third party library instead of us having to continue to release minor versions of uh, you know, this particular module to add new um, address formats or subdivisions or whatever. Um, so this is what the address... I have a question from Andy. Um, yeah. He wants to know if you think that the cart and checkout views are more FEMA friendly because in 7 table output was difficult to get rid of mm. make responsive. Okay, yeah, yeah. Um, let's come back to that whenever we start rolling through the checkout form. Um, but I'll, I'll, I'll make a note not to forget Andy's question. We, we can just say we'll do them at the end if you want, and then um, okay. Go sure, yeah, anyway. yeah, okay, sounds good. In the interest of time, I am going to skip forward just a little bit. Um, but if you do want to see the full um, presentation with um, more tie-ins to the Sport Overmeyer project, so like how these features impacted a project in the real world, um, the video from DrupalCon Dublin would be most informative. Um, so one of the first things that you do whenever you set up a Drupal Commerce site nowadays is um, you have to add or import your currencies. Um, and so if we kind of bounce back over here, I bet our Drupal site is done installing. Hey, look at that. Um, and so we are going to um, get in there. Um, password is a very strong password. Um, and just begin to set up our store alongside of the slide deck. Daniel, where are you based? I am from England, Yorkshire. Ah, okay, cool. Um, I don't know that we met before. I, I, know, I know Steve because he's just down the road from me in Atlanta. Um, I've only actually been in Drupal the last year, so, you know. Ah, okay. But I, I know a lot about eight, but not so much about six or seven. Okay. Well, you, you came in at a good time. Um, Drupal 8 really is pretty phenomenal out of the box, especially when compared with six. Um, but even, you know, over seven, it's a drastic improvement. Um, so here I have a, a Drupal 8 site um, that we've only just installed, but as you can see, it has the um, commerce modules in there. Um, little shopping cart block, it's empty, yay, um, and a commerce menu um, that's going to let me begin to configure my store. And the first thing that we do need to concern ourselves with is to add or import our currencies. Um, importing a currency in this context uh, doesn't mean you're having to upload a file, it just means that we have um, currency information for all of these currencies from all over the world um, pulled from the CLDR project. Um, and by selecting the ones that you actually want to use in your store, you are importing them from the file system into your site's configuration. So here we go. I've now added the US dollar to my site. Um, we can see that it's listed there. No need for me to actually edit it, but we can see that it has its 
um, you know, currency code and symbol and so on. Um, but now that I have my currency defined, um, I can then go and create a store that sets this currency as its default currency. Um, so this is really kind of the entry point for creating a, a new Drupal Commerce site is what currencies am I using? Um, and once I know, once I've imported them all, I then begin to create my stores. Um, so if we hop back, you know, Keynote doesn't like me coming back into it. And what, what I'm going to do is not um, go into presentation mode because I think that will help us out here. So let's uh, do this instead. Um, so uh, once I have my currencies started, I then create my stores. Um, I can have any number of stores, um, which is a, a huge improvement over Commerce 1.x, where you basically just had um, global store configuration, and that was it. Um, but now um, you can create any number of stores with their own specific um, configurations that represent you know, either uh, different stores on different domains or subdomains. Um, maybe you use the store entity for your different fulfillment locations and you add an address for each fulfillment location. Um, maybe you use it for a, a sort of multi-seller marketplace, like an Etsy-style marketplace. Um, but that, that store entity um, is a starting point for supporting any of that, and you always must have at least one. Um, that's going to include things like the email address that I want to um, have as my from email um, on any uh, communication. So let's go Ryan, my store. Um, select my default currency for this store. Um, we'll give this sucker an address. Nope, oh, it didn't actually import. My zip code, not my street name. Um, and then for billing, we're just going to support the US, I suppose. And my store owner is admin, done. Um, and because these are entities like anything else, um, you can add additional fields to your store. So for example, you might um, have a different uh, PayPal payer email address for each store if you're building a marketplace and wanted um, payments to be funneled directly to the person who's listing products for sale. Um, but now that I have one store, I can then begin to create products. And the idea is that um, every, every product and every order on the site um, is going to uh, belong to a store. Um, orders can only belong to one store, other products can be assigned to multiple stores if you want. And so what that lets you do is, um, you know, uh, what's a classic retail example? Um, you know, I'm, I'm in communications with a retail chain right now that um, has 150 some odd locations and uh, the uh, retail, they're all franchise locations and so the retailer, or the, the sort of product owner, wants to give each franchisee the ability to create a store for their location and publish um, the products that this, this company sells on their own domain. And uh, so what this would let um, you know, the, the product company do is specify um, which products can be sold on which store. So whenever I list a product, um, I can actually select this one should go to this store, that store, the other store, um, however I want it to work. Um, you know, another example might be um, you know, sort of a, a more typical multi-channel scenario where I have both my website and an Amazon store and I use these sort of store publishing settings to choose whether or not um, a product ought to be automatically exported to my Amazon store. Um, of course I, I got ahead of myself and forgot that the, uh, the publishing settings aren't going to show up unless I do have more than one store on my site, um, but we won't go back. Um, so that's, that's stores, there's more information about that on the Drupal Commerce blog, and in fact most if not all of these different sections in the slides um, do have a blog post associated to them. Um, we're going to sort of gloss over taxes right now, um, but uh, we, we are pretty happy to announce that our partnership with Avalara um, has seen us uh, create um, a new module integrating their REST API to sort of uh, function as our, our OEM automated um, tax calculation service. Um, so they are a, a paid service, um, but they do handle sales tax calculation, reporting, and remittance for the United States and Europe. Um, and, and probably for most countries around the world, I, I just don't know for sure um, what their support is like in Australia and Asia. Um, but, uh, you know, we, we do have pretty solid support for VAT thanks to our standalone tax library. Um, but we're still kind of developing the core uh, user interface around sales tax and you know there's, there's 
so a lot of complexity inherent in taxes, as you might assume. Um, so to talk about products for a minute, um, pretty much every e-commerce system out there has the same product architecture, and, and that is that of a product page that has one or more product variations for sale on it. Um, in Drupal 7 Commerce, I think um, most of us are familiar with the idea that, uh, in fact, I can probably just pull up a, a Drupal 7 site here. Um, you know, most of us, if, you, if you've done Commerce on D7, um, will be familiar uh, with the product entity listing out all of your different variations, and then a node type with a product reference field sort of binding them all together for what we called a product display node. Um, so the idea was you had to create all of your different SKUs. Um, they may or may not have attribute fields on them. And um, then once you had them created, um, you would create a node that had a product reference field that referenced that particular product. And this is the out-of-the-box experience. It's pretty kind of uh, lame. Um, we did improve it by eventually releasing the inline entity form module for Drupal 7 that allowed you to embed an actual variation edit form here. Uh, but out of the box, you know, you just kind of had to um, depend on this autocomplete to create multi-product product pages if you wanted to. And then we had a special display formatter that turned that product reference field into an add to cart form. Um, so not so for Drupal 8. Um, in Drupal 8, we actually decided that the product entity is the product page. There is no more dependence on a node type um, to define a product page. And so here I have uh, a product. Um, I can create the SKU in line um, and give that sucker a price. And if I hit save and publish, um, suddenly I'm looking at a product URL um, that shows product one for sale. And I can add that to my cart. Yay, I created a product page. Um, but um, not, not only can I do that sort of simplistic scenario where I have one variation, I can create multiple variations if I wanted to. Um, so I'm going to create uh, an additional variation here um, called product 2. And just because it's going to be more expensive. And if I wanted to, I could keep creating new variations. Um, I can also choose which one is the default on the add to cart form. So let's save and publish. And um, you know now I can purchase product 2, which we see here is the default product on the add to cart form. Um, but notice... Um, if we come back here to product one or two, um, notice that I don't have like a select list to choose from one or the other. Um, that's because as of yet, I had not given these products uh, attributes. Um, so let's kind of make sure I didn't forget anything in the slides, and then we'll sort of look at um, how product attributes are designed to work. Um, da -da -da -da. Yep, did not forget anything. Um, so product attributes, um, also in Drupal 7, were a bit complicated by the fact that um, we were just using sort of dumb fields for product attributes. So if I wanted to um, add a size attribute to a product type, I might use a select list field um, that uh, had my different options in it. Or if I'm feeling saucy, I might use a taxonomy term reference field and define my size vocabulary with terms for each of the sizes that I wanted to sell in my store. Um, but the problem with these... these uh, sort of a, a, anonymous fields is that um, the commerce system didn't really have a, a fast and easy way of identifying these fields as product attributes. We couldn't prevent people from deleting taxonomy terms that may have been used as attributes, which could then break a whole host of um, historical product line items and product displays and so on. Um, and so we decided that we really wanted to create product attributes and attribute values um, as our own entity types um, in Drupal 8. And you know, we, we did this because creating entity types in Drupal 8 is cheap. It's easy for us to create new config entity types and content entity types. Um, when we developed Drupal 7 um, Commerce, uh, the entity API wasn't near as robust as it, as it was sort of by the end of Drupal 7's life cycle, nor was it anywhere near as robust as Drupal 8's even for all of its warts. Um, now, because it is simpler for us to define new entity types, that's what we've done for product attributes. So let's go create a size attribute and um, kind of differentiate product one and two here by perhaps being different sizes. So if I look at my attributes menu, um, I'm going to add a product attribute just called size. Um, the uh, element on the add to cart form is fine as a select list. 
Um, but note that I can change it to radio buttons, or I can actually even render the attribute, which is pretty interesting. Maybe I'll come back to that in a minute. Um, I've now created a size attribute, and I can add any number of values to it that I want. And so I now have um, an attribute entity uh, with various value um, um, entities related to it, very similar to taxonomy vocabularies and taxonomy terms. I then need to edit my product type um, to add that attribute to it. And so no longer do I have to kind of go and guess and find a magic checkbox on a field configuration form. Um, I can actually just come to, um, oh shoot, <laughs> um, wrong one. I can come to my product variation type, um, edit it, and enable um, the size attribute on this product variation type. And what happens whenever I save this is that it does create a reference field behind the scenes for me, but it's kind of one less step for me as the site administrator to have to take. So if I look at my field list, um, we can see here that by enabling that checkbox, I now have a size um, entity reference field on this variation type. So when I go to edit that product and I look at my variations, um, I can now choose what size the different variations represent. Um, so product 2 will be a large variation and product 1 will be our medium variation. Why not? All right. So now when we look at this page, um, we have the attribute select list, uh, much like we would expect. So I can change from large to medium. And um, notice that we're doing just some kind of fancy uh, variation naming using just token-based strings to define these product titles. Um, add that to my cart, and we'll see that reflected in the shopping cart as well. Um, so we can see here product one or two. I have two mediums and one large in my shopping cart. And um, that's just a kind of a uh, new sort of JavaScript-y um, shopping cart that we provide out of the box now. Uh, of course, that, that is easier to theme, but it is still a table. Um, and you'll see that uh, as we sort of proceed through the checkout process as well. Um, the last thing that we can do that's kind of fun, um, and I don't know that I have good images lined up for this, and I'm kind of scared to open my image folder up on a live webcast. <laughs> um, so we'll just, uh, we're just going to roll with the text for the rendered attribute. But uh, I wanted to show what happened um, if I changed the uh, attribute style from using a select list to the rendered attribute. Let's see, go back here to product one. Um, and so what you can see is that it actually renders um, the attribute value and then behind the scenes um, you know, just has uh, radio buttons that it's selecting whenever you click on the label. Um, you wouldn't typically use this if you were just rendering a text string, um, but you can imagine that uh, this attribute could have been color and instead of um, those being uh, text, I could have had an image field that I was rendering for this attribute. And I do believe that Obermeyer gives us that example. If we can find real quickly um, a product that allows us to select a color. <laughs> um, I should have uh, preloaded one. Um, oh, but hey, these are perfect examples. So we'll go look at the jacket. And um, we can see that I can select my size. Um, these are fancy attributes rendered to just use the first letter. But I can also select my color. And again, that's using that sort of fancy attributes um, magic that we have in the attribute system. In uh, Drupal 7, we supported this, but it was through a standalone module called Commerce Fancy Attributes. Now it's just part of core itself, which is great. Um, everyone gets to take advantage of that, and, it's, and we benefit. Um, we benefit greatly just from that, that more robust attribute system at the core of Commerce itself. Um, so we've kind of already seen the Add to Cart form, um, the attribute fields get rendered in there based on my configuration of the attribute. Um, if we were to go look at the actual line item that's used for products in my cart, so we'll go to configuration, order, item, types. We can see that I have a default order item 
and it does not have any fields on it. But if I wanted to, I can add a field that gets uh, presented on the Add to Cart form. So let's just do that real fast. I'm going to ask people to customize their product um, with a plain text field. All right. And if we go to my form display, um, we'll see that I have a form mode for the Add to Cart form. So um, this is a new part of Drupal 8 that you don't just have um, display modes for your entity types, you also have form modes. And in this case, um, we have uh, kind of the uh, uh, purchased entity field that's responsible for looking at all of the um, product variations and creating the attribute selectors. Um, but I can also drag my name field uh, up into the displayed region, um, save that. And now if I go and look at my product page, I'm going to be asked to supply a name whenever I add this product to my cart. And so these are, these are again some of the basic building blocks that you'll have at your disposal um, as you're building your store. If I go and look at my cart, um, one thing I'm going to do real quickly is get rid of my sidebar um, on the shopping cart and check out pages. Um, just to make it a little more user-friendly and use up our space a little bit better. Oh, that's interesting. Apparently I didn't like the fact that I put a uh, asterisk before cart. All right. Um, so this is, um, as with commerce on Drupal 7 powered by views, um, the view could be edited to include things like the custom line item fields that I have, or um, I do, ah, I'm actually not sure if, they've, if we've uh, gotten around yet to um, supporting attribute uh, selection on the shopping cart form or not. So let's go to have a look. So if I go to structure and look at my views, and we'll see the various commerce views that have been added, including the, in the shopping cart block, the shopping cart form, the administrative views, and so on. Um, whenever I edit my cart form, I have the purchased entity field there, um, but I might want to add additional fields. And let's just see if we have the variation selector. Um, it, it very well may not be developed yet, in which case we can all send um, Matt Glomman uh, tweets asking him where the field handler is. <laughs> um, yeah, it looks like it's not in yet. Um, so in any event, we'll just go ahead and add our name. And why not just drag this right up here. And so the views module, which powers all of your administrative views and um, content listings, um, as with Drupal 7, is used to um, power your, your shopping cart and checkout-related and cart-related um, interfaces. So let's try this again, because for some reason it did not save my name. There we go. Um, looks like, uh, if, if I may make a note, I have found a bug. <laughs> um, all right. All right, I made a note to file that when we're done here. Um, so um, that's the, the cart and, and the shopping cart block and form. And, and yes, to get back to Andy's question, the default view is um, just dependent on tables. Um, you know, it might be worth looking at um, uh, kind of bringing into core the, the commerce, I think we called it uh, commerce responsive views or commerce responsive UI. and. Um, Drupal 7 that, that used just divs and CSS um, to create table-based layouts for the cart uh, block and form. Um, but that would be a good, a good feature request to kind of make that part of core um, if you're feeling like it. <laughs> um, so now I've proceeded to the checkout form, and lo and behold, I have an unexpected error. Um, it actually was expected um, because what's happened is uh, I've tried to access a checkout page without a payment gateway selected. And um, uh, as of right now, that simply throws an error. Um, so the next thing that we'll do in the site that we're building is select a payment gateway. Um, but just to sort of come back to 
no, where is the slides? Um, what we get out of payments in commerce.x um, is a, a more robust API and improved developer experience for writing payment gateway integrations. Um, so we actually have, I think, a, a lot more forms out of the box, so forms to capture prior authorizations, forms to void authorizations, uh, forms to refund um, payments, forms to prof process reference transactions. We have tokenization uh, built into the core API and user interface, um, and that is the card on file uh, functionality that you would get out of the commerce card and file module um, in Drupal 7. Um, for references, you can look at the Commerce Brain Tree and Commerce Auth Net modules that have Drupal 8 branches and depend on um, standalone PHP libraries for interacting with those APIs. And the idea is that um, what, what we want is to privilege at an API and in the default user experience level payment gateway APIs that support tokenization by default for no extra cost. And that, that is um, what's interesting to us about um, Braintree, um, AuthNet is still an upcharge, although I, I can't remember exactly if the new API has it by default. Um, but the idea is that it's just it's just a, a better customer experience uh, and more secure um, to just assume that every API that we're using um, supports credit card tokenization um, and then kind of lets us create more unique uh, checkout experiences that don't depend on directly submitting credit card details to an API whenever a, a checkout button is pressed. Um, so to enable a payment gateway, um, I'm going to go to my store, I'm sorry, my configuration, um, payment gateways. Uh, and one of the things that's nice about um, Drupal Commerce 2.x over 1.x is that um, rather than using the rules module itself to define payment gateway instances and, and configure them, we actually, again, have our own payment method and payment gateway um, entity types. And so I can add a new payment gateway. I can select the plugin that I'm using. Oh, shoot, I don't actually have any enabled yet. Um, I can give it a name, and I can create any number of payment gateway instances that use the same plugin. Uh, in this case, we're just going to use an example. All right. And so I, I can have um, basically um, different versions of the same gateway. Um, I can have um, you know, different gateways per country and use rules that determine when they should be shown in the checkout form, wh whatever the logic is. Um, so here I'm going to proceed back to my um, cart, go to checkout, and it's actually going to work this time. And so this is the default checkout flow in um, Commerce 2.x. Uh, you have uh, kind of a, a step where you put in all your information, review, and finalize. And we can do payment followed by review because we are tokenizing here on this step. Um, this is just an example, so this doesn't really matter. Um, but let's go on. And we'll see that um, I now have you know, a tokenized payment method. My address is actually associated with that payment method. Um, similarly, in the shipping modules, your, your shipping address is associated with a shipment that is created for the order. Um, this view can be customized to provide you know, that, that sort of in-checkout summary of the order contents. And for each checkout pane, you'd have an edit link to go back and um, edit the, uh, um, you know, the details that you've entered in before. Um, and so this is just kind of a, a more opinionated checkout design and flow than we had in 1.x, including you know, contextually labeled buttons and uh, so on. We're still um, designing the checkout completion page. I think it should be there in beta 4, but it will look much like um, uh, an order receipt email would look. Um, since Instead of just kind of the, the dumb text that we've always had for Commerce 1.x, we'll actually have, um, you know, a, a printable receipt basically for the order checkout completion page. Um, and then I can come to my account and I can see my stored payment methods. Um, or I can take a gander at my orders. Um, it's going to look like crap because, of course, I haven't themed it. Um, but we can see when, I, when my order was completed, which is a separate date than when it was um, uh, created, um, unlike in Commerce 1.x. Uh, and you know, there's a lot of detail here that you actually would uh, probably not show in a typical um, uh, live store. Um, 
But you know, um, a, a lot of what follows then is just typical Drupal Commerce configuration um, and customization. Um, the uh, last thing um, that I'll talk about before we kind of answer what questions we have before the next presentation comes on is promotions in core. Um, this is just a wireframe or a mockup that we've been working against. Um, but the idea is that we've merged the commerce discount and commerce coupon modules from commerce1.x into the promotions system in the core of commerce2.x. And a promotion might be a discount, it might be a special offer, it might be time limited, um, it could be uh, dependent on the products that you're buying or a coupon code that you're entering. Um, but all of that will be a core part of um, the commerce modules. And, uh, you know, we have at, in the core of commerce now an adjustments API that handles all of our pricing um, for the developers on the line. If you're familiar with the um, price component API in um, commerce1.x, the adjustments API is the replacement for commerce2. Um, and um, it's just a, a much more robust API for managing any sort of adjustment, either at the line item or the order level. Um, so whereas before, we just had a core product pricing system that could make adjustments at the line item level, this API also supports order level discounts and price adjustments, um, which is also how we would add, um, say, VAT or, uh, sorry, sales tax or shipping costs or other sorts of order level adjustments to an order. Um, so your line items are actually now order items, and order items only represent purchasable entities like the products or donations that I'm making or subscriptions that I'm buying. And adjustments would be used for additional things like fees, shipping costs, taxes, and discounts. Um, and because it is still an active development, I can't vouch for what we're about to see, but I'd be chagrined if I didn't show it. Um, we do have the ability to create a promotion, um, and we'll just call this a uh, Drupal 8 day discount. Happy birthday, um, Dries. And um, I would choose what type of discount that is. Um, in this case, it's going to be a percentage off uh, a total order. Um, I want it to be 10% off the total order. I'm not going to add any conditions, although I could. Um, what this does is it actually references, uh, so this is a plugin reference field that references condition plugins. These are core Drupal 8 things. Um, we built a, a reference field that lets us have like a rules user interface here, um, a lightweight rules interface anyways. And um, you know, then you use the inline entity form to create coupons if we want as well. You can set usage limits, when it should start, when it should end if you want it to, and whether or not it's active or inactive. And now that that discount is active, let's just go see if it actually works. <laughs> and Daniel, have any additional questions come in? Uh, Oh yeah, we're we're already on the questions. So. All right, hit me. <laughs> All right. Um, hey, look well, at that! Came in and it landed very weirdly. Oh yeah, you've you've adopted a, a point three system now. That's another point for you. <laughs> okay, so we did the tables one. That's probably going to depend slightly on your theme as well. Just so you know, Andy. Uh, right. Uh, someone asked for the link. Uh, Wes, can you tell us which link you were referring to again, please? And then we have, what is the PIM system that you have integrated for clients on Drupal Commons? Um, yeah, so we've worked with multiple um, order management systems that have PIM functionality built in, including Order Motion um, and Stitch Labs, and we're currently specking out an integration with Magento Commerce Order Management. Um, you know, Akenio is probably the most like-minded of the open source tools out there. It's based on Symfony um, and does a pretty solid job of just generic product information management, but I don't have direct experience integrating with it. Um, if I was going to evaluate a standalone PIM, though, that's where I would look. Um, Commerce Guys projects um, in the past have actually tended to just use custom Drupal installs as the PIM. Uh, Wes has got back to us and he says the docs Drupal commerce .org question mark. He wants to know the URL for your uh, official documentation, I think. Oh, yeah, uh, yeah, it is just docs.drupalcommerce.org. Um, so um, you can come there and cruise through the commerce2.x documentation. Um, just an, an unfortunate warning. Um, we did recently rearrange um, the hierarchy here, and so some links might still might be broken. Um, we're trying to fix all those. My apologies. 
Okay, so that's where it's sorted. So Patrick then asked, is Drupal Commerce more for an external ERP interface? Um, you know, I wouldn't say that it's more, um, but that, that is, you know, a, a pretty significant use case um, that we are seeing. Um, so I mentioned we did one for Zuora. We've also done one for Order Motion. I'm looking into doing one for Tessitura, which is a ticketing um, ERP. Um, and I know I've worked with others. Oh, I have another one sort of in the works for, for NetSuite. Um, and th the idea is that um, at a certain scale, people don't use their website to manage their stores. They use these big ERPs and order management systems. And so it makes sense for us to be thinking how to better, how to better support those use cases out of the box. Um, because a, a third-party tool just, just handles the complexity of multi-sites and multi-channels and multiple order workflows and call centers and yada yada, just, just better than a single Drupal 8 install would. Um, I, I can't say that it works necessarily better um, because we are paying attention to um, you know, improving the product management interfaces and the order management interfaces out of the box in Commerce 2. Um, but still, you know, you're, you're necessarily going to be limited. I mean, I think, you know, uh, uh, at the end of the day, it comes down to how much time and budget you have to customize the back end of Drupal versus integrating with a tool that the client may already be used to. Okay. Uh, Annie asks, are you able to configure commas to be a multi-store merchant setup with each store would have its own payment and shipping rules? Um, you are, and uh, that's why we have the store entity out of the box. Um, you could achieve this in Commerce 1.x using something like the uh, the marketplace module or something to that effect combined with the domain module. Um, I think you, you'll still need to use um, you know another module that lets you sort of set the store context. So, so basically, what happens is when you browse a site that, that has Commerce with multiple stores on it, we have a default. Um, you know, resolver for determining which store I'm looking at. You'll have to plug into that. We don't have a user interface for that right now. Um, so you, you essentially have to write your own resolvers that can say for this domain, um, you know, only show products that belong to this store and orders that are created belong to this store. So you're setting the context of the site. Um, and then you, you would do the same thing when it comes to, um, you know, your, your payment methods. Um, again, right now, out of the box, if we come back here to our payment gateways, um, you know, I really just have kind of a dumb list of enabled or disabled payment gateways, and you would have to hook into the, the sort of selection logic um, that determines which um, payment options are available uh, for an order um, based on the, the store that that order belongs to, basically. Okay. Um, next, we have, uh, what do you think of Acquia's choice to focus on using Drupal with Magento? Um, I uh, commented on Dries's blog about that, and I can kind of just point to that as the, the more robust thought. Um, but personally, I, th I think it's a, a smart move for them because there are a quarter million Magento sites, and Magento has all but given up on giving them a better front-end experience and more manageable content management tools. Um, so if you just look at it purely as a lead generation opportunity, um, Magento sites are, are notoriously difficult to theme and customize on the front end. And so, you know, Acquia has multiple case studies now. I've been on projects as well. Um, other Drupal agencies that I know are delivering similar projects where you're creating a unique shopping experience using Drupal and then integrating with Magento, um, you know, for checkout or promotions or what have you. And the, the reason that makes sense um, for, for some of these clients um, is that replatforming is costly and time consuming. Um, but if we can make Drupal Commerce act as a front end for Magento, um, well, then it, you don't have to try to sell somebody on reintegrating all of their back end tools. Because your shopping cart software is the tip of the iceberg in a big e commerce um, uh, sort of uh, tool stack for, for any, any merchant of significant size. And it's not recreating the front end that's expensive. It's reintegrating with your order management system and analytic system and CRM and uh, newsletter and marketing automation tools and so on and so forth. And so what, what Acquia is proposing to do here is to, to say to the Wilsons of the world, um, look, you don't have to re-platform to take advantage of Drupal. You can do this. And then that buys us time as the maintainers and developers of Drupal Commerce to improve the capabilities of commerce 
um, so that perhaps those uh, uh, merchants do eventually find a compelling reason to fully adopt Drupal. Um, so from my perspective, it's very complementary to what we're doing. Um, and I look forward to helping Aqueous customers understand how to make better use of Drupal um, and to maybe even use parts of the commerce ecosystem to create a structured representation of Magento data within Drupal. I think that's a very good way to put it. Uh, how much would be involved in migrating an existing site on Drupal 7 to the Drupal 8 version? Um, you know, it's it's going to be quite involved, um, depending on how many contributed modules you're using, which is the same answer you'll hear for any Drupal 7 to Drupal 8 migration commerce or not. Um, we do have a full suite of migration tools to migrate into commerce 2.x from commerce 1.x, um, Ubercart from Drupal 7 or 6, and um, OS Commerce and Magento. <laughs> um, so we are trying to cover our bases and make sure that people can migrate into um, Commerce 2.x, but you still have to think about, you know, all of your shipping modules and payment plugins and so on and so forth that you might be dependent on that haven't been ported yet or still works in progress on Drupal 8. <clears throat> if you have Ubercat and Commerce installed, will it cause problems with your site? Yes, do not use them together. <laughs> Um, you know, maybe it's not as big a problem on Drupal 8, but it, that's a sure, sure, uh, because of namespacing, but in Drupal 7 you're going to kill yourself. <laughs> yeah, generally you, you don't want two common systems, whatever the situation is, yeah. so choose one and, well, that's generally your answer. Are stores merchants configured by the site administrator, or can you create individuals and apps individual store owners? Um, maybe I missed the, the beginning of that. Uh, I, basically, I think they're on about having a permission class for a specific user type to administrate individual stores. Mm. You know, um, I'm, I'm just going to have to say that I don't know off the top of my head. Um, you do define who the owner of a store is, so I can specify any user I want to, um, you know, to be the owner of a store, but I can't remember exactly what the permissions are um, pertaining yeah. to like product creation, uh, but presumably, you know, if I'm creating a new product, if I have permission to, um, it's only going to assign it to a store that I actually have access to publish into. Um, but sorry. <laughs> no, it's, well, if if you've got that kind of permission structure already, then you should be able to really, with permissions, just say it so that a certain individual can govern it. Mm -hmm. so, Say instance of a store. Yeah. This one's yeah. a long one. With the name field address to order items bundle, can we, for example, recalculate the price based on the idea that the pizza product someone can add extra toppings and adjust the price <laughs> based yeah. on the selection? For D8, all this was done using rules. Yeah. Would that be the same way it is done in Drupal 8? Um, yeah, so I mean, we, we have multiple events now for calculating the price of an order item. Um, and, um, you know, s similar to Drupal 7, you would add, you know, fields to your line item type um, that represent, say, like a checkboxes list of ingredients or whatnot. And um, then you would hook into the uh, um, price calculation system and, and adjust the price accordingly. One thing that would be nice in Drupal 8 over Drupal 7 is that because your attributes are entities, you can add fields to the different values. And so you could say add a price field to um, your attribute options so that um, you know, the, the price is sort of uh, entered, uh, entered in alongside of the options. If I'm kind of speaking to a pretty complicated thing, but if I'm looking here at my size um, attribute, I might want to add a price field to them that represents Oh, uh, well, okay, shoot. Um, this is somewhat irrelevant because I wasn't talking about attribute options, was I was talking about line item fields, but you, you get the idea. Um, you know, you can add a price field and, and use the, the price calculation system to increment the price of the line item by that value, um, but because, you know, rules wasn't quite ready yet, we don't have the rules UI integrated here uh, to be able to rig that all up without code. Um, and so, like, Obermeyer.com, you know, has significant custom code um, that's driving a lot of the price calculation and customizations and order level adjustments for shipping and so on. Um, 
and and unfortunately that's just a a side effect of of where rules uh, and the rules UI was um, as of the last Drupal Commerce release. Yeah, rules can still be a bit flaky, so that probably is going to require rules, I think. Yeah. Uh, where can shipping methods be configured and shipping addresses inserted? Uh, the shipping modules are under active development, so that's why you didn't see it in my demo here. Um, but if you want to um, learn more, you're just going to go to the uh, shipping queue, and there is a uh, issue there that's called like 8.export or something to that effect. Here you go. The, uh, the, the meta issue for commerce shipping on Drupal 8. And um, about uh, halfway down the page, you'll see where Boylan has summarized our architectural direction. And you know he sort of talks through the different entity types and user interfaces that we'll have. And so the, the idea is that you will define your shipping methods and shipping services similar to um, you know, commerce 1.x. Uh, but then whenever you enter into the checkout form, we're actually putting your order items into shipments and the shipping address is actually entered onto the shipment itself. Um, of course, by default, it's just one shipment per order. And then whenever we do go through and calculate the rates for the services um, defined on your store, um, those are actually being calculated on a per shipment basis with a similar sort of summary selection, um, you know, uh, uh, for, you know, the, the, the actual price that you're paying or whatever shipping service it is that you want to have for your order. Um, but again, that's, that's to be developed. Um, we're actually seeking um, opportunities for people that may be interested in um, funding um, us to be able to dedicate time to the shipping modules. And we have a couple of bites, a couple of nibbles. Um, so if anybody's interested in contributing to that effort, either from their own developer time um, or just you know sponsoring the development so we can dedicate our own developers to it, um, you know, feel free to email me at ryan at commerceguys.com. Thank you. Mira asks, uh, is PayPal integration already ready, or is it possible to check out without payment, like um, for a yes, cash you... on delivery type option? Oh, yeah, yeah. So for, for pure off offline payment methods, um, I know that there's a patch um, that uh, Vasic or Tabby Toppernich has put into the Drupal Commerce queue um, that will be reviewed and hopefully integrated for the uh, beta 4. Um, PayPal itself has not been integrated although it's obviously on our short list because they are a good partner of ours, but they did um, ask us to prioritize Braintree this go around, which is why the, uh, the Braintree integration is out and the, the more traditional PayPal payment methods are not yet. All right. Uh, Peter asks, are you able to have multiple currencies with, mm, yeah, with a manually set price for each currency for a single product? Let's go see. I'm, I mean, I'm pretty sure that by default, um, what's going to happen is I'm going to be asked to specify the currency um, whenever I enter in a product variation. Um, but uh, as with Commerce 1.x, um, you could add any number of fields that you want to to your product variation type. And, um, you know, use it. Actually, I wanted to go edit. Um, and, you know, have different fields that represent the. Uh, uh, the different static prices that you want to set. So yeah, by, by default it's just one price field, uh, but again, you could create any number of uh, price fields on your variation type that you want. Okay, thank you. Uh, another long one. With a multi-store commerce setup, can the individual merchants configure where their own shipping methods? I think we said that shipping wasn't ready, didn't we? So Yeah, yeah and, and actually we just had a uh, conversation in the, um, the the commerce folks slack channel about this that uh, retail example I used earlier um, has, has sort of brought to light the need for your shipping methods to be content entities that um, store owners can create on their own um, ultimately we may end up having to sort of re-architect the payment system to support that too um, but at the very least um, in the current design um, the answer would be yes it just hasn't been implemented yet okay um, do you support in-place panel editors for product variations? Um, not as far as I know. Well, we're getting you a big to-do list here, aren't we? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, uh, I have mixed well, feelings I... about the panels module, to be honest. I mean, IPE was always broken for me on Drupal 7. I hear it's better on Drupal 8, thanks to Lightning, maybe. But, uh, yeah, probably something for us to look into afresh. 
Are there benefits to installing commas on a new site or existing, or does it not matter? Um, it shouldn't matter. Um, same same modules, same everything. You just make sure that either way you're still going to have to use Composer. Um, so if you don't have you know kind of Composer set up to run on your your current site, you're going to want to to figure that out. But here's you know how you would use Composer to add commerce to an existing site. If an order contains products from multiple stores and as customers pays individually for each marketplace item in each store, does each store get individual set of <laughs> pending? Wow, yeah. this is yeah. this is <laughs> inception commas. <laughs> well, you know, one thing that I can point to is, is that uh, you actually don't have nodes referencing products anymore. So if you kind of go to the beginning of that uh, question, um, you actually can't have the scenario described. Um, so, unless was it order, an order containing multiple? Yeah, con con containing multiple things from different stores yeah. that are going to be paid in in store. So, yeah, yeah. It'll be marked as pending as each is paid for. Yeah, we, we there's a lot of complicated workflows around multi-store and multi-seller commerce. Um, our our preference is really just for you to. Um, have one order, well you can only have one order per store, so if I added a product from multiple stores to a cart, I would end up with multiple carts, and I don't believe that the checkout form right now adapts itself automatically to check out multiple carts at once, so you would have to go through the checkout form more than once in that in that case, which I, I'm pretty sure that's how like Etsy works, if I'm not mistaken. Can we embed or call the form from the checkout flow from another URL? I don't know. That's a good question from Boyan. Hmm. I'm, I'm, it's, it, it can't be worse to work with than I made it in Commerce One. So I mean, <laughs> He's smarter than I am and I, and I imagine he's, he's made it a little bit more intelligent. The, the problem with embedding the checkout form in, on non-checkout URLs in the past um, was really just uh, all of the logic that the checkout router contained. Um, I know that we still do have a checkout routing system, um, and so I, I, I don't know exactly how that may have changed in Drupal 8, but I've definitely been deferring to Boyan on a lot of <laughs> those sorts of questions. Okay, thanks. Are there any contributed payment gateway products ready for commerce at this time? There are, but I, I honestly can't remember who has developed what. Because I know I've heard about Stripe being in development, Authorize.net and Braintree, of course, were developed by our team. And I, and I know that other people have done payment gateways. I just can't remember which ones. Okay. So we're back to the multi source site questions again. Right. Uh, almost the main store owner configures payments to go through his or her store payment method, bypassing individual store payment methods. And then upon an order completed later, the main site owner can then process payments on the back end to the individual store owners. So that's like taking one payment and then individually stripping down the payments to feed back into the individual stores. I yeah, I'm not sure. I mean, that, that really depends on yeah, which, which payment gateway you've chosen. Um, because at the end of the day, um, that's not necessarily like your, your shopping cart that, that's in charge. It's like, are you using PayPal's Mass Pay API or Braintree's um, Marketplace related API or, or you know some other API that, that really supports uh, distributing payments out of your balance? Um, is status of commerce reports ready for commerce? The dashboard, revenue, hmm. payment types, etc. You know, I, I know that we had to do some reporting for the Obermeyer project, um, but I don't know off the top of my head if that actually made it into the Commerce Reports code base or not. Um, and in fact, our, our plan for, for Commerce 1 is really to, um, sorry, for Commerce 2 is to find ways to integrate with, um, you know, third party. Uh, analytics engines for reporting um, and analytics uh, because there's only, there's only so much you can do with views, especially once you hit scale um, before you start melting your database server trying to generate a report. Um, so my my preference, and this is kind of something, yeah, so there, there's no branch yet, 
you know, something that, that we're, we're interested in developing as commerce guys is essentially our, our own Giraffe. Um, Giraffe was a, an analytics dashboard we integrated with for a while in Commerce Kickstart before they abandoned us, but kind of try to bring that back and, um, and use uh, third-party structured storage, whether that's you know, Keen IO or, or, or uh, some other you know, analytic, analytics uh, uh, warehousing engine, um, you know, rather than trying to, to build those reports out of views. Um, technically, though, you could build the views yourself if you wanted to. Are licensed products downloadable files working in Commerce 2 at this moment? Nope, not as far as I know. Yep, sorry, Gene. <laughs> um, yeah, sorry. <laughs> Are there <laughs> any plans for a Kickstarter profile for Drupal 8? Um, we're divided on that. Um, we have the Commerce Base Installation Profile, which essentially functions as the Kickstart 1.x, um, where it's not like a full, you know, robust store out of the box. Um, but, but quite honestly, like. A lot of the reason for Kickstart 2.x was because we weren't trying to improve Commerce Core in the ways that we are in Commerce 2. Um, so, like Commerce Kickstart 2.x was essential because we didn't have promotions in Core, and there wasn't like one shipping module project. It was like six different projects that you had to figure out how to string together. And so, I, I'm I'm kind of a, of a wait and see mind. Um, if, if we can actually execute on these, uh, you know the core plans and the sort of reimagining of some of these contributed module ecosystems like we are for commerce shipping, you, you may not really need a kickstart 2.x for Drupal 8. Um, the, the project base may be fine and then it's really just a matter of can we get a couple of people to contribute really sharp starter themes um, like we had for kickstart. I guess the ultimate question is then, uh, do you know when it'll be out of beta roughly? Um, we were hoping end of the year, um, but it's it's not looking like we'll hit RC1 by then. Um, I know that, that uh, Boyan got sidetracked by the shipping related stuff because we really needed to unblock some contributors. Um, and I'm just trying to think what else was the holdup. Oh, the physical fields module was a holdup as well. And occasionally he has to sort of step in to contribute to Drupal core. Um, for, for example, we needed uh, plugin forms to support multiple forms per plugin type, and um, they weren't going to until Boyan took some weeks of his time to contribute to Drupal 8.2.0 that functionality. Um, so, so barring any significant uh, hurdles like that coming up again, um, you know, we we might look for the end of January, um, but perhaps Boyan can surprise us and deliver us a, a Christmas gift. <laughs> um, but, but realistically, I, I would say that end of January is, is a better target. So. Cool. A aim for 8.3, you know, then you can go, yeah. 8.3 is here, and so is Commerce. Yeah. So that gives, that gives you another month. That's February. Exactly. <laughs> right. Um, that's all the questions, believe it or not. That was a lot of questions. So uh, if you're still here, thank you very much. And thank you, Ryan, for attending and uh, enduring the onslaught. Uh, no problem. Thanks for having me. No. And uh, well, so I, I, I wish that I, I wish that more of my uh, more of my answers were absolutely yes. But um, you know, hopefully the next presentation we do will will have a lot more um, road behind this. So. Yeah, we can always do your presentation for when it's ready. All right. <laughs> All right. Thanks a lot. Thanks, Ryan. Thank you, everyone.